Welcome to Charlas with Latina Republic. We are a nonprofit organization based in Southern California, dedicated to breaking stereotypes and building knowledge about Latin America, one voice at a time. My name is Soledad Cuartucci. I am the CEO of Latina Republic. Today, we are speaking with Apollo Torres, a painter and muralist from Sao Paulo, Brazil. Apollo graduated in industrial design at McKenzie University in Sao Paulo and studied painting at the Visual School of Arts in New York. His work dialogues with classical painting, street and contemporary art. With solo shows in Brazil, Italy and the United States and participations in festivals and collective shows in various countries, Apollo is an internationally recognized artist of Brazilian contemporary muralism. Hey. Hi, Apollo. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Good. It's so nice to meet you. Thank you so much for making time to meet with us. Just to give you a brief introduction, my name is Soledad Guartucci. I go by Sole. I am the uh, CEO and founder of Latina Republic. And we are a nonprofit organization in California that likes to feature stories about Latin America and unique people like yourself. And so uh, I'd love to have you introduce yourself and just tell us your story, essentially, how long have you been interested in art and where you are from, where you grew up? Okay, so my name is Apollo Torres, I'm from Brazil. Uh, I'm from the metropolitan area of Sao Paulo, uh, particularly a city called Diadema. And, but it's like, it's uh, all, you know how, how it is, like big cities, they kind of uh, grow and, and become like all the cities around become one. So yeah. it's pretty much I was born and raised in Sao Paulo, you could say that. Okay. And how long have you been interested in art? Uh, since I can remember, you know, since I was a little boy and, and I don't know, it's kind of that cliche of, of the, I was always the the person that would be drawing all the time, even in school, you know. So it's just it's just how I. Back. Uh, okay, I think you you're back. You froze a little I, bit. Yes. Were you able to hear me? Uh, not quite. But I think I'm back. Can you hear me? Yeah. So let's do the question over. Yes, I was asking you, how long have you been interested in art? When when does your passion for art begin? Yes, uh, let me just see. I believe it's my internet. Hello, can you hear me? Because the internet's not working well back here today, so I'm just going to Okay. I think the connection is gonna be way better. Oh, I hear you yeah. much better now. Yes, no problem. Okay, so we can we can try this question again. How long have you known that you love art? Right. When does when does it start? Yeah. So I I was always like the that uh, cliche of the, the person that was always drawing all the time, even in school, you know, um, drawing on a little piece of paper, even on the desk. And I don't know, I kind of always, always perceived that the, the dream of, of working with art, you know, mm -hmm. but I was always interested in different art forms. I, I was like a musician for a long time as well, like always liked music, never 
quite uh, made it in like a professional way. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, I was always like uh, studying and, and testing and trying different art forms or even writing, but mm -hmm. little by little, the, the drawing and the painting was always the the constant thing that the, that I would never stop doing, and eventually it became my my profession. That's amazing, and you know I have my list of questions, but sometimes I like to be spontaneous based on what you share. And so, um, how supportive were your parents or whoever uh, raised you, your community, in just really feeding that dream and encouraging it? Well, uh, as long as my parents are concerned, I was always like 100%. Uh, they were always fine with all these, these things that I like to do. They always pushed me and, and, and incentivized me. Uh, even with the music, you know, my band would, for, for a long time, it would rehearse in my house. So <laughs> they, they put up with a lot, you know, <laughs> but, and, and they are not like, I, I, I don't come from like very like wealthy family and they were not like into art in a sense that we would never go to art galleries. Mm -hmm. Very rarely we would go to museums, you know, mm -hmm. they like, I was, I was never poor either. We would, all, we were always like middle class, but they were like working people. They were never like really, really interested in art in that way. You know, <laughs> uh, we would go eventually when it was like biannuals in Sao Paulo, sometimes we would go there. But it was not something that was part of my family, like, uh, yeah, it was, it was not something that, that came from there, you know, but they mm -hmm. would, they always realized I, I, I like arts and mm -hmm. they always, they always did what they could to, to make it flourish, you know. That's so wonderful because oftentimes our parents worry about our financial future and will try to sway yeah. us into quite you know the, the good careers and yeah, uh, yeah that can be very stifling uh to a child or to a teen that is thinking but this is what i love to do this is my path and somehow i'm going to make it work so i think it's really important to have those supportive people in our lives so that's yeah wonderful. for sure and so the next question i want to ask you i'm starting with like kind of like deep personal questions in terms of finding your way and then I'm going into murals and detail of what I've observed and I'm just uh, I don't have a background in art but I do love beautiful things and uh, creative people and so the next question is um, what sacrifices have you had to make to get where you are today well that's a hard question you know because I don't think I have really sacrificed a lot in because as I said, I was always kind of uh, stimulated into doing it and, and doing it well, you know? My father, he was always like, uh, he was not super critical, but when he would see something that was like, you know, why are you writing it this way? Uh, like, or why are you drawing this or, or that, you know? He would always kind of, uh, I don't know, try to to stimulate or criticize in a in a positive way, you know, not to not to bring me down, but to keep me keep me growing, you know, and and getting better. But uh, I think the most the thing I sacrificed the most was like financially, you know. Because it took me a long way to to start like really uh, making like steady money and being able to support myself, you know. So it was like, uh, yeah, it was always hard in that sense. It still is in a kind of way. But now, now I I have my family, you know. I I it's it's easier but it's never constant, you know? So 
I don't know, it's the struggle that artists have to go through, I guess, you know. But in the beginning, it was like a long, long time without getting any money. And then sometimes it would, something great would come along. But I think financially is always was always the hardest part because I could never understand really like how much money do I make, you know, instead of like um, to be able to really plan anything long term, you know, and I feel like even today, it's kind of hard for me to like look and plan things ahead, like five years ahead, you know, uh, where do I want to go or how, like, what can I can I start doing now or what can I bet now? Because I I'm never sure of anything, you know. So I think this is the this is the hardest part. It makes so much so much sense, and I think that that is the struggle for creative types who yeah. choose the path of doing something that is deeply meaningful and for which you're born to do. And then the reality of the material world that we live in, right? And how, how to live in, in this world, what not betray ourselves and do that something that we really love. So I understand uh, what you're sharing. And uh, going along with this theme, I wanted to ask you, what life lessons has art taught you so far? Well, you know, I think it's the... Aside from being an artist, I'm also a cyclist, you know, even more or less professionally as well, because I work in a, in a, a cycling, how do you call it, club, yeah. So I've, I've always been a cyclist. I raced bikes for a long time when I was a teenager or like a young adult. Uh, I never... Well, aside from when I was very little, I never dreamed of being a, a professional athlete. You know, I left that aside a long time ago, but uh, I always used my bike as a means of transportation and I kept riding my bike just to keep uh, fit and um, just to like, you know, for my body, for my self care, you know. Uh, but uh, that's something that both cycling and the arts taught me was that you just get you just have to keep pushing on you know and it's not most of the time it's not really about where are you getting to you know like uh, there is not uh there's not a finish line anywhere to be seen you know you just kept you just have to keep pushing and try to enjoy the ride as best you can, you know, enjoy the views and, 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 uh, I don't know, push through it. Uh, so I think this is the, this is the most important thing, I guess, you know, cause it's really hard, uh, in the beginning to, to get something like, so you can be hopeful that this is going to get somewhere and you're gonna get something out of it, maybe be able to live out of your art. And it takes a lot of sacrifices, you know? I, in the beginning, I worked as a illustrator. So I, I worked in some companies and I work in the textile industry, work, uh, doing like illustrations for, for to be printed in, in clothes and stuff. And when I, when I left my last job to start working as an assistant of an artist, I like my, my paycheck was cut in half, you know, but I took, I took that gamble because I was, I realized that the company I was working at, I, I just didn't have anywhere else to grow, you know, because the illustrator in the company, like, I would maybe become uh, an art director, but I not really, I guess. Like if I wanted to keep growing, I would have to to become a stylist or something, you know, like maybe change pathways in, in terms of being able to grow inside the company because for the illustrator, that was it. 
And but I I thought that working as an assistant for that artist, I would be able to finally understand how could I how could I make money doing my own art, you know, because that was something that never I just never met a professional artist like a living one, <laughs> you know. Uh, so I, I just I just didn't believe it was possible to be able to live by making art. That's why I never went to to fine art school. You know, I I am a graphic designer because uh, I thought it was there was more job opportunities working as a a designer than an artist you know but then i met this guy and and he offered me this opportunity and i took it and then i worked with him for a year and it really opened my mind in terms of um how do you like i think the the technical parts i i learned a lot from him but i think the most the most i got was the professional part you know like how do you how do you get make money how much do you sell your art for uh to whom and how and how how does everything work you know and then after a year i rent a studio like a small studio and start trying it for myself you know it took it took a lot or like many years still to be able to to support myself properly but you know at least i i had a i had something to look to you know that is amazing that sounds like a very important mentor how wonderful to have that inside the business side of your work in terms of some ideas on what what will my my art be sold for what should i be making that's very important information too so that's yeah. that's wonderful that you had that insight that's great yeah and that's one that it's the kind of information you don't get in right. in art school, you know. Nobody is gonna is gonna teach you that unless you work with other artists or at least if you are around them, you know, somehow. That is yeah, and that is the big missing piece, and that probably makes yeah. a difference in the longevity of living as an artist or falling apart when you don't figure out the money part of it. And so that sounds like really a, a great mentor there that you came across. Yeah, for sure. And uh, I also wanted to talk to you about if there's any social causes that you are passionate about and how they might appear in your work. Well, I have many, like plenty. Uh, I would love to support like anything that's going to that like any initiative that uh, strives to get like more equality, more, uh, you know, more like a, a more fair word, world for everybody to live on, you know? Uh, I don't think I have uh, one particular thing that I support the most, but I try to be able to show my support anywhere I can, you know? so. For example, I have a, a, one of my most known murals is one here in Sao Paulo that you can see like a little girl uh, holding her hands up and uh, there's some books. And that piece was made, uh, I was invited by this uh, global campaign for education called Education is Not a Crime that started in Iran. And so it's about uh, uh, like just shining a light on the reality there. That now, years later, I, I did that in 2016, but right now things are exploding over there in Iran for the exact same reasons, you know? And, and uh, I, was, I was invited by a guy that lives here in Sao Paulo and he's Baha'i. Baha'i is the, the religion, like the second biggest religion in Iran. And they are very oppressed because, well. Uh, so 
he asked me, uh, he saw a small mural that I had. He liked my work and invited me to do that one, you know? So I came up with that image that was supportive of their cause, but also it was, at the same time, I was worried that, you know, when you put some, some big artwork in the middle of the city, it, it becomes a landmark, you know, and people, people start, uh, it really, it really touches people, you know, a lot more than I expected at first, you know, but I took some hits in the beginning when I would do some art and then I would suffer like uh, such a backlash from like conservative people and stuff. Uh, and, and then I immediately realized that this was like really powerful, a lot more than I anticipated. You know, I, in the beginning, I thought that only, only like young people and people that were interested in graffiti and street art were like scanning the walls and, and really paying attention. You know, I just thought the other, uh, the other people were like oblivious to it. But then when I start doing some, it wasn't even really provocative uh, work, you know, in any way, but people started like really pushing back, you know, and I was like, my God, this is, this is something. So when I was about to, to do this work, I, I really thought about the people like that live here in Sao Paulo that don't know anything about Iran. And how would they, how would they see it and interpret? So I really tried to do a piece of work that would would fit for our our own problems with access to education. You know that they have a different nature. It's not it's not a religious nature, but the state really makes it difficult for people to get access to education here. And in that particular year, uh, the state of Sao Paulo, which was, is the state that I live in, they were about to shut down 90, almost 100 uh, uh, schools here. And so the students, they just took over the schools, occupied it, you know, in protest. So, that was going on in here. So I, I really thought I, I should do a work that would be able to be interpreted uh, and, and would fit for our own problems as well. You know? So that's the kind of thing that, that I try to do and that I try to be aware of. But there are many others, you know, uh, I don't know if you saw, uh, I think in my Instagram is one of the one of the other two that are pinned uh, right at the top, there is a guy uh, with striped shirt, uh, a bike, and uh, a big like backpack. These I guys are, yes. yeah, they are like delivery guys mm -hmm. for, for, there's an app here. I don't know. You guys should have something similar, maybe not the same app, but yeah. Uh, it's a delivery app, so you can order food and they will bring it. Yes. And it really, really exploded during the pandemic. But these guys, they are like pushed to the limit by the company. And it's, uh, these companies right now, they found a way, like both these delivery apps, but Uber as well. And, you know, there's something going on with the work relations that they are they are evading the the normal forms of like hiring somebody and paying like all the things that you have to pay for the rights and and uh i don't know i guess in america you guys have a little bit less rights like work rights than we have here but in here, uh, every December, you get a 13th pay, you know? So uh, also you have a month of paid vacation. Uh, 
a lot of things, you know. Uh, and these guys, they don't have any of it, you know. If if they get if they get sick or if they get injured, they don't get anything from the company, you know, no support at all. And and the fares keep changing. So they uh, when they started, all these companies they they kind of want to create a monopoly. So in the beginning, they work they work. Uh, how do you say? Uh, they don't make any money. You know, they make everything so cheap for the customer, and they pay really well for these workers, and they don't make money. And they took they take over all the market, and then they start changing things. But by that time, you can't fight back because they own everything. You know, everybody depends on them. So this is something that's been going on here. Like all the restaurants now, they depend on these companies. This particular one that's called iFood is the biggest one in Brazil. So most of the restaurants depend on them for the delivery. And and if you're a delivery person, you you can't get a job directly with the restaurant, you know? So it's something that you can get out of and it's really hard to fight back. So I made that mural in support of the delivery people. So, uh, oh my God. just give me one second. Of course. So I don't know. I, I, I think I have said too much already, but <laughs> no. you got the idea, you know. It's uh, so interesting, and I love yeah. that you made those uh, the mural, and I think you also have a a set of paintings with an older man that also does delivery. Yes. I really love that I I use that in my my story. Oh uh, yeah, yeah, uh, that's that's work. right. Yeah, I saw it exactly. That that guy was a uh, last year. I was in a. Um, uh, art art residency here in Sao Paulo during the pandemic. And this guy used to work at a restaurant that was like literally across the street from the residency. And we would have lunch there almost every day. It was like really cheap and nice food. And then this guy was one of the delivery guys that work at, at that restaurant, you know, and I was already like researching these subjects and uh, the new forms of work relations that, that we have is something that interests me a lot. And then when I saw that guy, I was like, my God, this he's like a, um, he was, I don't know, he encompassed so many of these things that were going on because not only, not only they passed like two, two laws that really changed things here in Brazil. One of was related to, uh, how do you call it? Like the pensions when you get older and then you retire. Right? And so they changed that and they make it, they made it harder for you to retire. And it, now it takes longer. Uh, and also they changed the, some of the laws, uh, like how you hire somebody, and that like paved the way for these companies to be able to mm -hmm. to work that way, you know. So that guy, he is like both, like a victim on both ends of those things, you know. And so I, I well, we we became friends, start talking, and I realized it was a good idea to make a work about him. Oh my gosh, this is like a lesson on social problems in Brazil. <laughs> so yeah, but it's 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 uh in the world actually, you know, because like these drivers, like Uber drivers, this is something that that goes on everywhere. everywhere. I just heard, I just heard a podcast the other day that was uh, talking about this guy. I think he works in the U.S. as a Uber driver or mm. I don't know if it's Uber but some some other okay. and there is like a gamification of the the app you know so mm -hmm. they make it really they make it really 
a vice, you know, mm -hmm. you can't get enough of it, you know, and you want to keep scoring and, and making mm -hmm. money. And so the fares change and then you have to be always aware. So when the fare changes, you, you will get more money, you know, so have to be like available all the time. It's, it's really something, I don't know. It's really incredible what they're doing, you know? Yes, I heard of it also something similar in, uh, in Mexico and in Colombia, but I can't remember the name of these companies, but it's very similar to what you're describing, that they're exploding everywhere, that people yeah. are, just, are very addicted to having this service, but then their underside is what happens to the workers. Exactly, yeah. So yes, thank you for that, that information. I'm very, very interested in that. And then talking more now about your murals, I wanted to know how does it all start? Like, how do you find mural work? Who hires you? And once you're hired, what is your artistic process or the steps until you finish a mural? All right, so there are many ways this can happen. Um, one of them is when there is a company that wants or needs a mural and they can like contact me directly and I would and I will do something for them. One example is the one from your article, yes. you know, it's like a construction company and they were doing uh, this new building and from the beginning, even when it was just a project. I don't know if it's uh, if it works the same way in the U.S., but here, what they do is like they they get this piece of land, so they make the project and they create uh, like a small house where they can where they can uh, how do you say uh, they can talk to the clients and you can buy an apartment there, and then. After they get enough sales, they start building it. And then after a while you get your, your apartment, you know? <laughs> so even from the beginning, they asked me to, to do the illustration for them. Like that was, I think three years ago mm. to do the illustration so they could put it on the, on the, the project and people would really buy something and, and be able to see how exactly how the, the building would look like once it was ready, you know? So now that the building was almost finished, they, they, they said I should come by and do the, the real piece, you know? And I don't know, the building should be, should be done by now and, and they should be delivering it to the customers. So, that was one thing, you know, that's possible. Mm -hmm. But also some other projects, like uh, I just painted on two festivals just now. I still haven't posted it because I, they, didn't, they didn't make the final photographs yet mm -hmm. of the pieces, mm -hmm. but I'll, I'll be posting them soon enough, I hope. Uh, but when when these festivals happen, they, it's usually there is somebody that organizes the festival. They get money, like a little bit from sponsors and a little bit from from this uh, public uh, public resources for cultural things. You know, like from maybe the city, uh, the city or the state or whatever. And so they invite a bunch of artists, they get a neighborhood, uh, talk to many buildings, see if who is uh, willing to, to, to get their, their building side painted, you know? And they, they, they invite the artists and we go there and we paint it. When it's like that, you get a little bit less money, but you get, free, uh, you are really free to paint whatever you want, you know? So you, uh, there is an upside and downside, you know? <laughs> yeah. Oh, but um, so 
yeah, that's it. Or maybe if I really want to do something and I can just knock on somebody's door and ask to paint something for free, you know, that I used to do that more before. Now I don't have that much time uh, anymore, but every now and then, you know, we, we would still go out with some friends and just paint something, you know, old school way. <laughs> uh yeah because when you're in the beginning you just have to show your work you know right. and best way is to like get some wall and paint something and people start uh noticing it uh, that's exactly how that guy from from iran uh noticed me i paint something for free on the wall and he saw it and he liked it and he invited me you know and then uh so i guess that's it you know Maybe this is the, the three main, uh, main ways you get to have your work on a wall. That is really interesting. And so, yeah, I was going to ask you also, in your opinion, what is the role of the mural in a, in a living space, in a development, in a neighborhood? And also was going to ask you about the creative freedom part, which you already answered that in some cases you have some creative freedom. But what impact do you hope to have through your murals? Okay, uh, let me just go back a little bit because when you, when you talked about creative freedom, I think I have something else to add. Okay. Um, when, when like a client asked me like uh, for a commission, most of the times they have something in mind, you know, like for example, the this building that i just painted that that you put on your article yes they they had some things that were part of the dna of the project okay. that they wanted represented you know like this is a building that is a little bit different from the the way they they do it most of the times here because sao paulo is really a really car dependent city you know mm -hmm. so uh, most of the buildings they have like many many stores of of parking space right. and and you know so people can just get with their cars and park it inside the building and so this building is a little bit different they have no parking space at all they have uh uh, space for stores in the the street level and so it's more like uh, more modern more young people mm -hmm. like to to live there and it's it's close to the metro station mm -hmm. so they wanted to reinforce that that as aspect of like you can you can it's it's near the subway you could get your bike and get around because a few years ago i think maybe less than 10 years ago mm -hmm. there was this mayor here in sao paulo that really decided to build a lot of bike paths because sao paulo didn't have any mm -hmm. all the bike paths in sao paulo were inside the parks you know Mm -hmm. So there was like, I was, as I said, I was always a cyclist. I always used my bike as a means of transportation, but we would just ride in the street with the cars, you know, that's the way it was. So this guy, he said he would build 400 kilometers of bike paths in four years. And he did. But this was like the the all the conservatives all like most of the left and the right wing people they just went nuts because <laughs> they were taking away their their car space you know their <laughs> parking space in the streets or their lanes and mm -hmm. it was really really uh it was really crazy to be a cyclist in that time you know because people would just curse you in the street out of nowhere, you know, call me a communist just because I was riding my bike. Wow. You know, these people are crazy, but 
uh, so these guys, they, they asked me to do that. It was okay because it was already something that was part of my life, you know, riding my bike and, and they asked me to do the, the bike path and yeah. things like that. So, but sometimes the things people ask is, is really not something that I was, that I'm interested in, in talking about at all, you know? So then you have to be able to, to talk to them and extract something else and find some common ground, you know, mm -hmm. especially when it's, it's companies, because many times the company guys, they, they just, they, when they approach me, they want something that's really institutional, you know, maybe about about the product that they make and it's something like um and i'm not really interested in like drawing your product you know you have other ways to communicate that i'm more interested in 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 understanding like what what's the model of the company maybe you know something that that drives and something something that you believe as a company that you stand for. And I much rather do something that will, that's gonna represent some kind of value that's important to you, you know, that I can be more, more free to find some, some image that is more poetic maybe, you know, and less, less direct. And so, it really depends on the case, you know. That makes a lot of sense. So it's a, a how do you say it? A negotiation, right? With the yeah, person that yeah. hires you with a, you know, just trying to find your truth within what they are looking for and just finding the mission, connecting to that mission aspect of it. Yeah. So that I get that. And but so, also yes. I'm sorry. No, please but, go uh, ahead. It was there was a second thing that I wanted to approach was uh you i think you said something about what on the function of the murals or yeah, something the role like that of the, mural. Exactly. the role yes mm -hmm. so there is another thing that we artists have to always be aware and it's not always that we can escape that but most of the not most, but many of the these festivals or um, people kind of use the artists as a means of of um, revitalizing some neighborhood. Yes. In order to be able to gentrify it, you know. Oh, I see. So many times. We you have these like uh, kind of degraded neighborhoods that they start to they start to become cool with the young generations. Like maybe there's some like abandoned warehouses that they start doing like uh, uh, parties or or uh, concerts or it becomes. Uh, like uh, bars, some nightlife starts to appear. People start drawing on the walls and kind of start to become a cool neighborhood, you know? So that, that's when they start bringing like the high profile artists mm -hmm. to paint on the walls and they start to make the neighborhood look nice. And then all of a the sudden they start building all these new buildings and all the people that used to live there can't afford to live there anymore you know so that's uh that's something that like all the artists that i met in all the countries that i've been to so far they all say the same thing that that's something that happens like everywhere in the world uh we are used in in that in that way you know but also on the other side there is the there is 
our relation to the people, you know? So in that sense, our role is, uh, I believe, is to, to, to open some discussions, you know? I don't, I don't really believe we, we are able to like change the world or anything like that, you know? One person can't change anything. I think change is always collective, but when when you can create some like big landmarks in the city that way, you start uh, proposing some conversation with the people, you know? So you just put something like, you know, let's look, let's look to, to this, let's talk about this. And I believe that these big murals really have a power to do that, you know? Uh, bring some discussions to the table that maybe people were avoiding, and now it's right on your face, you know? But yeah, there's always this struggle between uh, the interest of, of the, the, the powerful people that have the money and the interest of the people as a whole, you know? Wow, I never thought about that. That's interesting. And then how to protect the integrity of what you're doing, right? How, how to not get used and still provide something of value to society through your art. Um, I don't know how it's, you do that, but it's something to think about. It's hard, yeah, because we know, uh, I don't know how it is over there, but in here, this last, maybe the last decade, uh, the artists have become more like stigmatized as uh, well with these polarizations between like uh, left and right wing. You know, mm -hmm. most of the artists are left wing, so we are always kind of stigmatized as uh, as I don't know a little like hypocritical because artists sometimes make a lot of money, but they criticize, I don't know, criticize capitalism or something like that. Oh, I understand. Yeah. But yeah, so, but we artists are, we are working class, you know, not all, not all artists <laughs> realize that, you know, because we have a, we have more freedom than most workers, yeah. but in the end of the day, in the end of the day, the money that comes to us come from somebody that has a lot of money, you know? So mm -hmm. it's coming from the very same hands that, that I don't know, exploit and, and use the working class to be able to, to do what they want, you know? Mm -hmm. And we, some, like many times, we are being used in that same way, you know? Sometimes we have the freedom to do something else. And sometimes we find like little cracks that we can say something that maybe it's not exactly what they would like us to say, you know? But we really have to be smart to be able to do that, you know? Because otherwise they're just gonna use us same way they use all the other workers, you know? Wow. It's so interesting to learn uh, these ideas from you, the, your life perspective, because as an outsider, you just see the art, but you don't know yeah. the story behind who is the person behind this? What is the collective struggle of those who per, you know, put together this art for everyone to enjoy? And so this is really uh, unique insights that you are providing us. So thank you for that. And then how does the local person factor in in a design? How do you how do you make sure that your vision is going to resonate with the people that are going to see it every day or have to cohabit with it? Does the local perspective matter or or can it matter? It does, it does. Well, I already told you the story of that mural that I was uh, it was important to me to make to excuse me. Uh, to make it like uh, so that the problems with education in Brazil yeah. were like contemplated by the bureau. So mm -hmm. that's one example of yeah. uh, how it is. But um, 
Well, I can tell you a short story about another mural that I don't know if you saw it, but it's in my it's in my website for sure, or in my Instagram if you roll like <laughs> okay a lot. Yeah. It's a it's a work from 2013, but you can find it on my website. It's a it's a drawing of this guy that he has a bird feeding out of his hand. You know, mm -hmm. he's like the bird sitting in his hand eating, and in his back he has a uh, like a bird cage, like mm -hmm. hiding behind his back, you know, mm -hmm. with another bird uh, trapped inside the cage. Okay. So that work I I made, uh, this one I made just because of the those backlashes I said I got. Mm -hmm. I was just starting to become a little bit more noticed uh, here in the city, you know, I was, mm -hmm. I I already had like a decent uh, work like on canvas and I was getting like participating in shows here and there. Mm -hmm. But my mural, my mural work was not so developed. So I couldn't do like the realistic paintings that I was already doing in the canvas. I didn't quite realize how to do it in a large scale because Back then, I was still using like spray paint and stuff mm -hmm. like that, and it wasn't the best material for me to do the realistic painting. Mm -hmm. So I was still trying to figure out. And then I painted something uh, at a park. They did like this meeting of of artists, and we painted a lot of walls inside this park in Sao Paulo. And I painted a guy with a spoon in his hand because yeah. I I liked spoons. I, I do it a lot, you know. I was doing it a lot back then. But then uh, some some person that was that went to the park complained to the directory of the park because they said my drawing was a uh, how do you call. Um, God, I forgot the word. They said it was incentivizing people to promoting? use drugs. Okay, promoting, like promoting. or suggesting. Yeah, promoting. Yeah, yeah, yeah promoting. Yeah, uh, because I don't know. I suppose you could use a spoon to to I don't know use heroin or something. Right. But it was just a spoon, you know. Yeah. <laughs> it was not something like that. But it was always, it was also a little bit prejudiced by the part of the, the person who saw it because this guy had like an Afro hair and long beard. Oh, okay. So, so yeah, it, it becomes a, a mix of like many things, you know, it's like uh, racism and prejudice okay. against like maybe homeless people and so he sees the spoon in this guy's hand and they complained to the director of the park and they just they just erased my work you know oh my gosh they didn't even talk to me you know they just oh we don't want any problems so let's just erase it wow so i got i got this piece erased and then in the same week i had just finished another piece that was it was a very simple drawing, but there was two people, like a, a couple, and they were naked, like <laughs> fully naked, you know? Okay. And but it was nothing like sexual or anything. They was mm -hmm. just two naked people, you know? But somebody from the neighborhood complained to the police. There was a, I don't know how to say this in English, but I think there there's a law here, well, I guess everywhere that you can't just walk around naked, you know, <laughs> and you're gonna get fined, you know. So yeah. they just said that 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 piece of work was that, you know, and the the wall that I had painted was was a wall on the on the front of a tattoo shop, you know. Mm -hmm. They they didn't have anything to do with it. They just 
they just let me use their wall, you know. But then the police came to their place and they wanna they wanted to find the the tattoo shop. Okay. So the guy that owns the tattoo shop just uh, painted the 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 parts that <laughs> wasn't <laughs> supposed to be out in the open, you know. And and then he contacted me. Oh, I had to I had to censor your work because I was gonna get fined. And both these things happened like the same week. Oh, so wow. I got I got really pissed and I painted I I I painted on the same wall of the tattoo shop this piece that I said with the guy with the bird eating his yeah. hand. Yeah. Because I was like, I wanna do something that to discuss our freedoms you know oh, because really? all these, you know this uh it's mostly the conservatives but not only but they always they they always keep talking about freedom you know that they are they are uh they are pro freedom you know because mm -hmm. i guess i guess people <laughs> are not tolerating like any kind of joke anymore if the joke is full of prejudice or people don't tolerate racism same way as it was tolerated before so they feel like they feel like they are getting they are getting uh they are getting censored in a way mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. they just don't realize that uh the intolerant are not gonna be tolerated anymore, you know. Nice. So, but they are they they keep saying they they are pro freedom, but once they see something that they don't like, they are the first ones to to try to you know. Right. Especially here here in Brazil, that like wealthy and white people they are very. They feel very entitled mm -hmm. of like uh, getting things their way, you know? Yes. So I do this painting. I use the bird as a metaphor, you know? Right. To, for the freedom. And th this guy is, is, is letting the bird feed out of his hand, you know? Yeah. He seems very, he seems very, very nice, but behind his back, he's imprisoning another bird. Mm. And then a few weeks later, I get a letter from an um, association of these like uh, bird viewers, you know? <laughs> yeah. And they no. said my work, my work was, was, uh, incentivizing the capture of of <laughs> birds you know oh, wow and then i was like oh my god here we go again and and but that's exactly what i said was when i realized the power that this this painting walls thing had you know because like people really got um uh, touched by it in a way, you know? They just don't realize that their, their um, interpretation is not the only one possible, you know? That's right. People, That's tend to, right. people tend to think that the way they interpret something is, is the only way you could ever interpret something. They don't realize that that's just a mirror, you know? That's You're looking right. at yourself, you know? And because you can't you can't possibly filter what you see through any other thing that other than your own life experiences you know That's so if you're a want. bird lover if you're a bird lover you're going to look at that and you're only going to see a person uh catching a bird you know and but that's that's just how it goes you know I, I don't know if that answers your question, but uh, it I, is. I, I, I it does. I that is quite a story. I can't believe that you've had all these different complaints, like 
back to back to back about perception of what your intended message was and, and what that means and that you've had to sometimes go through somebody really just erasing your work or changing it to appease them. Uh, it's going to yeah. be hard to please everyone. <laughs> yeah, I, I never intended to really, you know, I just, uh, what a, I don't know, I guess before I wasn't, I wasn't anybody. So I was easier to push around, you know, and now I am a little bit more, uh, people know me a little bit better, you know, mm -hmm. so I guess I earned a little bit of respect, mm -hmm. but uh, I don't think it, it has changed. Uh, I, if, if anything, I think it, it has gotten worse in the last mm -hmm. few years, you know, because of politics, yes. but, but now, I don't know, I guess, I guess I don't care anymore. And I, I, I learned that this is gonna, this is how it's gonna go, you know, and some people are just not gonna be okay with what I paint. And that's on them. But I guess people don't just erase my work anymore, just out of nowhere. Because I've earned some respect, you know, if they do it, uh, I guess the it's gonna make gonna make enough noise you know that's right so you just gotta but that's a it. good thing <laughs> yeah you can defend your work a little bit better now and uh, i wanted to ask you a little bit about art residencies for an audience yeah. that may not know what that's about it sounds so amazing it sounds like a really incredible type of like an internship experience where you learn a lot and you get to practice yeah. in a different space. So if you can explain a little bit about what that is and how many of them or what different types you've participated in and what you took from them. Okay. So I, I haven't done like many mm -hmm. residencies, uh, but I guess the most important one was this uh, I did last year because I really got to stay in a new environment for six months with six other artists. Oh, fun. Working there every day and exchanging, uh, exchanging ideas and looking at each other's works and mm -hmm. talking about each other's works. So you really get a new perspective and, and you offer a new perspective as well to mm -hmm. the to the other artists and it's something that that is really it's really good for the growth of 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 your work you know and also to be able to be in a place that you're not used to so right. that's uh i was that one was in my town so it's not the ideal like to do a uh, art yeah. residency in your own mm -hmm. city because the the best Thing is to to go somewhere else to do it right. but it was the pandemic so it was it was what what we had available you know it was kind of the end well they thought it was the end of the pandemic then there was a second wave right so we were kind of we were kind of scared in the beginning and a little bit distant but then as time went by, we were like more open and we start walking around the neighborhood a little bit more and meeting these other people. So I met that delivery guy mm -hmm. and things like that. But I think it's the, it's two things. It's, it's the, the connection with the other artists or, mm -hmm. and the curator or the other people that will visit and talk to you, but also if you can, like the the residency is going to put you in a different space, you know that you didn't you didn't uh, you, I, you never went, or maybe you you didn't go to that particular part of town usually, you know, and you get to experience it. And I don't know, it becomes it becomes a, a becomes something you can study, you know? I like it. I think that that sounds really 
amazing to be able to focus solely on creating something or learning, kind of like a discipleship in a way and learning from one another, being open to new ideas and growing. Yes, yes. That sounds great. And yeah, you touched upon it a little bit uh, about the pandemic. I wanted to know what projects were born uh, for you during the pandemic? What, in, what were you inspired to create during that time? I did see uh, under your paintings uh, a section called Refugio. And I believe that there's yes. a mention that that was uh, inspired by the pandemic, that we were all in a refuge of, uh, because we had no choice but to make a refuge as to where we lived, from where we lived. Yes, precisely. Uh, that was the first painting I did during the pandemic when it was at, at the worst you know like everybody was really scared and yeah. uh, really shut from the rest of the world and but this is a painting that i was meaning to do for more than a year prior to the pandemic so i already had this this canvas with the like the blueprint of the apartment, you know, right. uh, already sketched. Mm -hmm. But I had done uh, a wall with kind of that same idea before, not quite as as uh, detailed. But I did that on a wall, and I really liked the idea, but it was really hard. Uh, so I decided to do it on a canvas. And do it properly, you know, like dedicate more than a month putting everything on the on the painting. Yeah. But I was like too scared to start, you know, because I I knew it was gonna be so much work, and I don't like to spend too much time on a painting, you know. I I don't think I uh, ever spent more than two weeks on any work, you know, wall mm -hmm. or whatever, you know. Okay. So. So I knew it was going to be more than a month of work. <laughs> so I just had I just had that that canvas sitting there for more than a year with the blueprints sketched and I was <laughs> I was never starting it. But then when the pandemic hit, I was like, okay, now's the time, you know. I'm not going to have anything else to do for right. God knows how God knows mm -hmm. how long. So I just took that painting and I start doing it. So that is not really how the blueprint of my apartment is. I kind of adapted it to the to the space I had on that particular canvas. Right. But but I drew a lot of inspiration from what was around me, you know, like the mm -hmm. the little things like my washing machine or my you know, my I love stove the details. And, yeah, I just put everything there and the things that that we didn't have at home or wouldn't fit the 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 composition I would invent or maybe look for for references online like trying to find pictures of things and you know I came up with that but the the characters in there are my family you know there's <laughs> me my wife and my daughter yeah. and I don't know. It just it was something that only I was only going to be able to do that during the pandemic. I don't know if I'll ever paint something like that again. You know, mm -hmm. uh, the guy, the the owner of the gallery that I work with, he would really like me to paint a lot more uh, pieces like that. You know, but I don't know if I'll ever will because it's. Um, it's not really the way I like to to do the paintings because I don't like mm -hmm. to spend so that much time in one work. You know, I mm -hmm. I like more the the loose brush strokes and mm -hmm. being more more spontaneous. You know, and with that, you you can't be spontaneous. You know, you just have <laughs> to you just have to really get immersed in it for a long time. So you spend about two weeks per painting average, would you say? Most of them, it's even less, you know, a week. Sometimes. Oh, wow. But yeah, but I, I don't work usually. I don't work like uh, uh, at one piece at a time. 
you know, because it takes some time for the paint to dry. So I will, mm. I will do one, uh, one day of work and then I'll put this painting aside and tomorrow I'll work on another one. Okay. And then I see. two days from now, I'll get that one back. It's, <laughs> it's dry already. So I'm, when I'm like painting for an exhibition or something, I'm always working at two or three paintings okay. at the same time, you know? Mm -hmm. But I don't like to spend more than like seven days on a painting. Usually I, it, I like to do even less, you know? I like to to do one like a la prima, they say, you know, like paint something at once with large, br large brushes, you know, okay. like little detail, but I put all the, the major shapes all at once, you know, mm -hmm. and then I I come back to it one or two times, just adding the details that are really that are really needed, that, so you can see the the figure. But I really like to to leave the the brush strokes and the, the paint and all the gesture, you know. Mm -hmm. If I keep working on it, it starts getting like too photographic, and then. I don't like it because <laughs> okay. then you could just take a photograph. You know? Right. That makes a lot of sense. I also had written here, but you, you touched on it a little bit about the paintings under the category of storm. I noticed you had two women staring at a spoon as <laughs> you talked about the spoon, but it did intrigue me. I'm like, what is the connection between a storm and a spoon? And what are they, what are they looking at? Well, yeah, this, these are like a mixture of two series that I used to do. And in these particular canvases, the two series like merge, you know, but mm. Storm is a series that I would do with all these uh, figures that were like uh, inundated in mm -hmm. water. You know? that. Mm -hmm. And so that was because Sao Paulo is, is a city that was built over the rivers. Mm -hmm. You know, this used to be a rainforest in here, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's very wet uh, kind of kind of environment. Mm -hmm. And and it's very hilly, you know. Sao Paulo is that there is no flat uh, ground anywhere, you know. Mm -hmm. So so uh it's all like small hill hill after hill after hill mm -hmm. and what it does it creates all these little valleys that water naturally flows to you know right and but since it's a very hilly uh landscape mm -hmm. the easiest way to build like all the major avenues was over the rivers, you know, in right. the valleys. So they just uh, they just uh, channelize the the rivers, you know, mm -hmm. and put them like in big uh, uh, big tubes under and build the the avenues over it. On top of it, wow. So yeah, it's it's the it's the cheapest way because. <laughs> You you didn't have to to like cut all these hills to make the avenues, you know. You just use the the valleys. But what it does is when it rains too much, like especially in the like during summer and the end of summer, especially like mm -hmm. February March, it rains pretty much every day, you know. And it's like by the end of the day like five o'clock in the afternoon it will rain like for an hour just really hard mm -hmm. and it's like too much water too fast every day and it just can't handle it so it floods you know it floods. But, mm -hmm. yeah it's something that happens every year and and uh, i don't know it's not something that's easy to fix you know because all the all the city planning was was done like that you know mm -hmm. and i don't know it just i started doing this series of 
at first it was really literal to just paint what I was seeing, you know, every year. And it was something also kind of interesting, like visually, because I would have to make, create a, a plane that would cut all the figures in half and becomes a mirror. Mm -hmm. So I would, I would paint the figures twice, you know, with slightly different perspective on each, like when I paint something like this, if, if the, the viewer, the, the observer is looking at this figure from, from above, the reflection is going to be the same figure, but looking from, from below, you know? Okay. So I, I would have to paint these figures twice, mm -hmm. like from two perspectives. It was something that visually was interesting mm -hmm. uh, in a technical way, but also it was something that was, was, uh, I don't know, some, some way of thinking about the, the, the problems that we have to face in the city, you know? Okay. And, but that became a thing. And after a while, I just, uh, I just wanted to keep using the, the water as a okay. symbol. And I started to like reinvent, uh, reasons for that water to be there, you know? And I start becoming more poetic about it. And, and well, and then the water kept uh, appearing in my work for different reasons. Mm -hmm. And, and then, well, that, that's it really. Uh, but the spoon was something else, you know, it was like, at some point I started doing a lot of portraits and the way I would train was when I was on the subway or, or, or the bus, I would draw other people, you know, I would start mm -hmm. sketching mm -hmm. and I would always choose people that were working, uh, looking at their phones because they were distracted. They would, they wouldn't realize I was painting them. I was drawing them. And they wouldn't move too much either, you know, they would just be standing still. And, but then it, it kind of got me, it was the very same time when I bought, when I bought my first uh, smartphone. And I started realizing what, I don't know, Instagram and the things that I had in my computer before, you know, was in my hand and it's very addictive. And the like social networks is always something that's full of like vanity, you know? Mm -hmm. So I started, uh, replacing the, the phones in people's hands mm -hmm. with this spoon that they were using kind of as a mirror, you know? Oh, okay. And, and the, the idea was that they were like feeding their vanity, you know, like, uh, Ooh, getting. I see getting like a little, little, uh, how do you call it? Small doses of, of vanity, you know? And it's, a, it's also like the way you project yourself to society, you know, like what you put on your, what you, what you put on your, on your social network. It's mm. not the whole of you, you know, it's just the part that you want to show to people. So in a way that's also, the same thing you do when you were about to go out in the street, you look yourself in the mirror. If you're like, if you're looking the way you want, you want to be seen, you know? Mm -hmm. And I don't know, I just did that, that link. And I start using the, the, also, uh, I, I don't think they use that anymore, but back then, uh, the timeline was called news feed, you know? Okay. I remember that. Yes. Yeah, so that's it. I would have never gotten that from the spoon, <laughs> but but I like it. As a, as you were describing that, uh, I was thinking about the spoon and the woman looking at the spoon, and I thought, okay. And something else that I might see now that you explain this is what we feed ourselves, right? What we tell ourselves, what we how we absorb the world, the stories that we tell ourselves, and how they reflect back into anything that we look at. So, 
that. I keep thinking about that. <laughs> so that ties into symbolism. I noticed some themes in some of your paintings, like food, fruits, uh, for example, plates, uh, sometimes mm -hmm. empty plates, windows, water, and people that are focused on a task. That's what I notice as well, that you have either someone reading a book, somebody looking at the phone, and somebody uh, maybe uh, on a bike or waiting to eat. I also noticed some, uh, that it, the paintings seem to be more individual than collective. Like I don't see a lot of groups that I noticed that it's more like a, a one person at a time doing something. Um, I don't know. So that's, that's uh, I want to talk to you about the symbolism. If, if things have a unique meaning or, or, or why they appear in your art, like food, windows, water, and focused people. Okay. Um, I'm not sure everything is like uh, thought, well thought, like to the, you know, sometimes right. I just paint something that, that I feel like painting. <laughs> and I never, I never, I never stop that, you know, uh, <laughs> actually, most of the times I just start painting something just because I want to. Mm -hmm. And then after a while, maybe sometimes months or years, I look back and then I do the connection of, oh, this, this and that was going on in my life back then. And mm -hmm. I was painting this and that, you know, <laughs> and it becomes like a self, uh, self discovery. Mm -hmm. Yeah, of like mm -hmm. me analyzing myself, you know, like what what I was going through and mm -hmm. what was what was going on in my art, you know. So I make a point in keep doing that, you know. So anytime I I feel like painting something, I just do it, mm -hmm. even though I might not have a good reason or a good concept mm -hmm. for it. Mm -hmm. But what I do now is uh when i'm because now it's more rare, rare for me to like paint canvas like one at a time mm -hmm. when i start painting canvases is because maybe i have a an exhibition a few months from now and i have to create a body of work so what i do is i start painting in this way you know just painting whatever comes to my mind and then after I have uh, three or four paintings, I start putting them side by side and start to like understand what kind of what kind of narrative can come out of it, you know. Mm -hmm. And then the concept emerges from these first ones, right. and then. I create a small story or a little something that is going to be a then I start looking for for holes in this story, you know, like missing parts. Mm -hmm. And then the the last painting is they they come to be able to fill the gaps, you know. So in the end I have something that is for this concept, but in, the first ones are always like a a really free genesis, you know, and then the, the 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 final ones they come more more well thought and oh sorry and and they they have a purpose from the beginning. One example of that, and I'm gonna come back to your question about the pandemic, is the another series that you can find on my website that's called the day before oh, yeah. I saw yes. that. that one was my last solo show it was also during the pandemic uh, but it was it was like that when the first wave uh start to fade out and we thought the the covid was gonna go away you know mm -hmm. I did this this uh, this solo show, 
and then a few weeks later there was lockdown all over again but uh what happened was when i was producing it we were still in, in the pandemic mm -hmm. and i start i started doing these things same way as i described you know just not not really thinking too deeply about it but then what i realized that was like i feel like i i want all these paintings to be happening in the same day you know as if all these scenes are scenes from the same day these people don't know each other they have nothing to do with each other okay the only thing they have in common is that all this is happening in the same day and then i was like uh maybe it's a day that uh that it's like just the day before something big is gonna happen you know that nobody's expecting and then uh by by the end of it i already realized i was just being kind of nostalgic about the the time before the pandemic hit you know when mm -hmm. everybody was oblivious and mm -hmm. and and yeah i was kind of maybe missing that that normal life maybe and also reflecting on how how little control we have over everything you know sometimes we are so worried about doing things the way we want and then something big hits and we never saw it coming you know so the whole the whole exhibition was about that and the, the name was the day before so I it. yeah one, and i i saw that and uh, i immediately of course thought are you going to do a series on the day after because <laughs> i'd love to see you know how does the story continue like what what surprised yeah. them yeah i don't know <laughs> maybe <laughs> maybe maybe not yes and i wanted to ask i'm going to wrap up a couple more questions i've taken too much of your time but this is really fascinating um okay i'm going to be selective let's see i still have quite a few questions but do you have a dream project or something that is really big that you hope that someday uh you can achieve sure yeah i um I just never had an exhibition in a museum before. That's one, one, one particular kind of space that I don't have much. Uh, uh, yeah, I just never got to, to infiltrate that kind of space yet, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, and it kind of makes sense because uh, I'm more well known for my, my, outside work you know so i guess in a way like here in brazil at least you know the the street artists are not very represented in the in the museums and these institutional spaces mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. in a in a way i guess it's because the the curators feel like our work uh belongs outside you know mm -hmm. and it makes sense but i feel like i have some other things that i would like to do and mm -hmm. they are not really possible in the gallery space because it's more i don't know there's always something that's more commercial i guess in the gallery space you know you can do like big works but you have also, you've got to do some smaller ones that maybe are going to be easier to sell. You know, there, mm -hmm. there's kind of some restrictions. I don't, I, I never not do something because I don't think it's going to sell. If mm -hmm. I want to do it, I do it. But I just try to, I just try to contemplate like a variety of sizes and, and, and things like that so so maybe uh, we're not stuck with a bunch of like huge paintings that can't fit anywhere you know <laughs> right but i guess um uh, i guess the museum 
can provide some some creative opportunities in terms of not being a, not having to care about that at all you know because it's not for sale you know mm -hmm. and but you know and still still waiting for that opportunity I am sure that it's going to happen. That sounds like a great goal, a realizable one. Um, and then the other question that I wanted to ask you is, what advice would you give a young person considering a career in art? Art. Well, I would say uh, keep on pushing, you know, because it's, in the beginning, it's really hard. It's really hard to get your work noticed. Mm -hmm. And it's it's for a variety of reasons, you know. And your work is not really that good in the beginning. And also, people don't know you. Like, you don't have a, a fan base. You don't have followers. So it's hard to, to get your work scene and stuff like that but um i guess one thing i would say is like keep studying you know because i i see that a lot in the people people that come from like street art and graffiti there is a little bit of uh, prejudice against like formal education in arts because many people feel like it's going to restrict, like mm -hmm. then maybe you're more free when you do whatever you want in the street. And when you go to art school, maybe people will try mm -hmm. to put you inside a box and, and try to shape you in, in that, uh, I don't know, that way of thinking. And maybe that's true to a point because I don't know, academia has, like all these little things that, that they do and they they value, but that you you just you're just gonna be restricted by it if you want, you know. If you if you take what they say as a as a rule that you can't escape from, then it becomes restrictive. Mm -hmm. But if you if you take all that and you select what makes sense for you and you ignore the rest you're going to be fine, you know, but mm -hmm. I guess if you just try all the, all these other ways of doing it that they are going to present to you, you're going to have more tools, you know, to solve problems later, you know, mm -hmm. you, you don't have to use them, but maybe sometime in the future, you're gonna, you're gonna face some kind of problem that you can remember, oh, I could do that and it's gonna it's gonna solve this, you know? And you you only get those things if you study a lot and if you study a lot a lot of things outside of maybe what you what you think is your identity of what you wanna be, you know, because your identity is gonna change over time, you know. You're not gonna wanna be the same person forever. And if you try a bunch of different things in the beginning, I think you're gonna have more tools later, you know? That is so wise. I love that advice. That's really good. And I, I think I would add to that, be open to being shaped and to being changed and be open, you know, just the humility of the learning curve, right? Of the learning process, being yeah. open to taking different ideas and trainings. The last thing I ask uh, is, I was excited to see on your website that you teach virtual courses. I think that that is amazing. Um, your virtual art classes that you have? Yeah, uh, I teach painting for a long time now. I, I have taught uh, in, in like primary school for four years, arts and music for like, uh, uh kids from six to ten That's and then awesome. i then i start working at another art school like for like free courses for older people oh. start teaching like graffiti and street art and then i start 
I started to develop my painting and I started to want want to share that with other people, you know, so mm -hmm. I stopped teaching street art. That was like really, really like the basis of what street art is. So I would teach a little bit of everything, you know, mm -hmm. what's uh, what's stencil, what's uh, collage and, and the how to use a spray paint. You know, it was a very basic course. Yeah. And then I started focusing more on the paintings and how to make your paintings bigger, like how to amplify it in a, in a like with method, you know, because I struggled so much in the beginning with like mixing colors and like very simple things that you shouldn't have to shouldn't have to use your intuition to mix paint you know i'm very <laughs> against that you know you have to use your intuition you have to use your intuition in terms of well i'm gonna paint this with green even though it's not green in real life because there's some there's some poetry to it you know but you have to be able to mix the green that's on your head without having to fight with the palette, you know? Right. You have to be able to make the color that you want to make, you know? And in that sense, when I learned how to do it with like, uh, with, with a, a method that made sense and would, and would work every time, you know? I was very compelled to share it, you know, with the mm. students, you know? This is how you mix paint. You do this and then this and then this, and you gotta get to the color that you want, you know? And then you use it, you know, the way you want it. Um, so I start doing that and I, you know, I've been teaching for a long time, but then during the pandemic, we just couldn't have students anymore, you know? So I just uh, came together with a friend of mine that's a video maker. And we created a uh, online version of this, this course that I was already teaching, you know, oh, okay. and then we put it out to be able to also, it was something that I really want, I wanted to do it before, you know, because I kept getting like messages from people from other states that they wanted to, to have to, to, to do my course, but they just couldn't come to Sao Paulo to do it, you know? And they were like, oh, when are you gonna come to, to here to, you know? And I was like, I don't know, man, I can't, you know, it's hard. It's, uh, it's when you put the trip and, uh, and all the traveling expenses and everything, it just doesn't make sense for me to go there just for that, you know? So it was a way of, of, making people that are not from the same city that I am to get access to it, you know, and also to be able to give, uh, what do you call it? Like, uh, a scholarship yeah? when you don't mm -hmm. charge for the tuition, you know, when I mm -hmm. see somebody that, that would like to, to, to learn what I have to learn and they don't have the means, I just send them the link, you know, here. <laughs> go learn and that's it you know they don't have to come to my classes either but they have access you know that's wonderful now what about for international audiences like if i wanted to take the course do you have you thought about or perhaps you already do have captions in those virtual courses so it could be taught taken by someone who speaks english or spanish yeah you know uh, there is like um subtitles to it but they are uh automatically generated okay. so maybe they're they are not always 100 percent accurate <laughs> mm -hmm. but they are good enough you know I, I guess from what i saw you can understand what's being said especially if you know spanish you can get a lot now would you have to be a, a expert or do you have to have prior knowledge or is it a beginner course no it's it's not really a beginner course okay. but it's it's a uh, it's the kind of method that that 
has a foundation and then a build up and a conclusion to it you know okay. so if you if you're not a, an artist you can get like you can get a sense of how to do it from the beginning you just have to maybe practice more <laughs> like uh, all the, the 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 modules you know because right. it starts it starts from the foundation like from the drawing and then it starts to we I start to talk about values. Like values, don't know if you're aware of it, but it's like uh, light and dark, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's a monochromatic painting okay. that's built that's built over the drawing that you do first, you know. So first you draw the thing and then you paint it with black and white to be able to create the shapes and the light. And then you learn how to mix the paint and you start coloring over that same black and white thing that you did before. And then there is some other tweaks to the color and how you how the colors relate to themselves. That's gonna make your painting look more, I don't know, more realistic if you want, mm -hmm. or just enable to create um, different planes and maybe so you can give more attention to a specific part of the painting that you want. And then the other things are like more in support of that one figure, you know, to create like a, a how do you call it? To create a hierarchy, you know, within okay. the painting of mm -hmm. what what's more important and what's less important. And so, all these things that they are built one on top of the other, you know? Mm -hmm. So if you're, a, if you're an experienced artist, maybe you can watch the whole thing and understand and start to, to use it. And if you're a beginner, maybe you spend more time working on the foundation, you know, mm -hmm. and instead of doing just one, you do 10 and then you get on the other, but it's it's something that it's for everybody really that's great well i was excited about that and i thought this is really smart and it also shows your your entrepreneurial side too just taking what you have learned and making it available for others just continuing to use your talents and skills in a way that and continue growing your brand and what you've learned and to share it with everyone so i thought that was great yeah thanks All right. Yes, well, Apollo, um, those are my questions. I've really enjoyed speaking with you and I wanted to thank you so much for taking the time to share um, everything with Latina Republic. And so we wish you all the best and I can't wait to see your work in a, in a big museum, some famous museum somewhere in the world. Yeah, <laughs> thanks, I hope so too.